welcome again to this DCD webinar uh, on engaging the private sector in practice. Um, again, my name is Melina Heinrich Fernandez. I am deputy coordinator of the DCED, and um, I will essentially moderate what will be an interview of our speakers from USAID and CEDA. I will introduce shortly and followed by about 20 to 30 minutes Q&A. So we hope to give you enough time for questions. Um, feel free to already submit any comments or questions you have as we go along in the chat box. Uh, and then hopefully we will get back to them uh, after the presentations. Also, just to say, we are recording this webinar. So um, if anyone would like to catch up later on the content, you can do that on YouTube. Now, um, on the topic of private sector engagement, clearly engaging the private sector in development is now a top priority for many in the development sector. And that really became clear, uh, clear to me again when um, actually I looked at the registrations for this webinar, which came from a wide range of organizations from different sectors. Um, and we probably all have a little bit of a different understanding of, of what ESE really is and what we use it for, but I think there is now um, a common agenda really to engage the private sector more strategically in development and uh, making our own organizations more fit for purpose to achieve this. So um, it's great that our speakers today from CEDA and USAID are happy to share some of their progress and lessons learned in this regard. Um, both are, I would say, relatively decentralized donor agencies, which means they face opportunities for innovation in engaging the private sector on the ground, but also challenges when it comes to, say, building staff capacity in the field and getting an overview more generally of what works. Um, so we will hear on these issues um, on CEDA's side from Maria Spitzman, who is deputy head of department at CEDA, as well as Lolo Daru, who is senior advisor. Um, and also, we are pleased to have Amy Lovejoy from USAID on board, who is a division economist for economic growth, environment, and agriculture at the Africa Bureau. Specifically, um, CEDA will share with us some key findings from a review of 13 field-based PSE initiatives that they recently conducted, uh, with a focus on both enabling factors and challenges for private sector engagement. And uh, Amy from USAID will tell us more, especially on uh, the new on-the-job learning program on PSE that they have called Pivot, um, and what has been learned really in the first year of piloting this quite um, well, innovative approach to capacity building. So let's get started, and actually we will start with, with Sida and Maria. I was wondering, um, you know, we had in 2010, CEDA was given an instruction actually to to consider the private sector as a strategic partner across operations, and triggered actually the development of of several new private sector collaboration instruments. Can you tell us a bit more about how CEDA's engagement of the private sector has evolved since then, and also what you have tried to achieve with the recent uh, review report? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, around 2010, we we started developing new instruments to, uh, to enable us to work with the private sector in a transparent and predictable way. And the instructions to do so came from our new government and also from the top management of CEDA. Uh, within CEDA, it was a different kind of atmosphere and the commitment was not that high. Uh, so instead, when we developed the instruments, we worked closely together with the private sector and different private sector associations to develop instruments like challenge funds and the private-public uh, development partnerships, as, uh, as illustrated on the slide. Uh, and as I said, um, Within CEDA, there was um, the main focus was changing of attitudes uh, to create a new mindset among our colleagues to recognize other actors besides the traditional ones to see that you could um, see the potential of working together with the private sector. 
and that took a while. So the first projects were therefore mainly driven by headquarters and a small team. Gradually, there were some brave embassies that were added to this list. So the first projects that we did about 10 years ago, they were, they were pretty isolated and standalone projects. But, but of course, since then, a lot has changed. And today, the most progressive embassies, they do their analysis backward in sort of analyzing the act. Uh, actors. So if the objective is increased youth employment, they try to analyze which actors do you have to work with. And that can, of course, be ministries, authorities, civil societies, vocational training centers, and of course, the private sector as the main employer. So we have moved from a very, very isolated standalone projects to a more systems approach. And uh, in this approach, the private sector is one actor among many in a holistic portfolio. And in the best examples, such as Somalia, uh, the team has not only created a holistic portfolio, uh, working with different actors, they have also looked at different kind of instruments um, that are needed to support the companies along their life cycle. And they combine different kind of instruments, for example, uh, challenge funds, giving seed money, and then moving on to result-based financing, and then adding on guarantees to, to enable companies to scale up. And this, I think, is captured in the picture you see in front of you as a bridge, a bridge over the financial gap. But I would still say that this is the exception uh, it's not done at every embassy today, uh, rather the best ones such as Somalia. And uh, why we then, uh, why did we do this study? Well, we realized that some of our field officers had really moved ahead and they had developed new innovative ways of working, but headquarters was left behind. Uh, and that meant that there was very little transfer of knowledge between different embassies and also between embassies and headquarters. So the aim of the study was to capture this uh, development that had taken place and to facilitate learning. Thank you, Maria. Very interesting. And uh, what's also interesting about this review is that it actually has concrete case studies um, which showcase results achieved. And it actually struck me that challenge funds such as Innovations Against Poverty and ASC React um, have achieved impact at scale. Um, another example mentioned in the report, the collaboration with H&M uh, to improve industrial relations in Cambodia is now being replicated in other countries. Um, could you perhaps briefly describe these um, three interesting examples and the results they have achieved? Yes. Uh, in the report, we are looking at in innovation against poverty number two. Before that, obviously, there was innovation against poverty number one, which was our first challenge fund, which we developed in-house. We made a lot of mistakes and a lot of learning. It was, it was far too broad. It captured all sectors and all countries, and it didn't clearly spell out what was most important. Was it the innovation height or was it inclusive business? And it was mainly focusing on the competition stage. So this IAEP2 that you see in front of you is much more focused. It's covering four sectors and four countries, agri-food, wash, energy, and ICT. And it's Cambodia, Ethiopia, Zambia, and Uganda. And in, uh, in these countries, the sectors are linked to the country strategy and hopefully also to their portfolio. It has also a much stronger focus on inclusive business and small entrepreneurs. And uh, there are many innovative ideas that have been funded. For example, biogas stoves in Ethiopia that is mainly used to, to make injera. And uh, the picture is also one example of an innovative solution in the wash sector. Um, I move on. Uh, 
uh, to AECF, which is uh, it's a completely different challenge. And if I can say it is my favorite one. Uh, it's a big fund. And in contrast to many other, most other challenge funds, I think it's not run by a fan, fund manager. Instead, uh, AECF is an organization. It's registered as a non-profit company. And the main of advantage of organizing ACF like this is that you you continuously build experience and knowledge, and it doesn't disappear with the fund manager when the uh, consultancy contract ends. So you have a much stronger and much longer continuity, and that means that you can also support com companies during a much longer period. The active support today, I think, is around five six years. And that is then followed by another two, three years where you sort of have a, a bit uh, hands off monitoring. Uh, so this means that you have a relationship almost uh, eight, nine, sometimes 10 years with the company. And they have a very sol solid system for monitoring. And not only a system, because if you have a relationship with a com company for six, seven years, of course, that, that uh, makes it a very strong relationship. And also ACF, uh, they have a very comprehensive approach. Uh, you remember I said that in the beginning, we focused only on the competition stage. ACF is in the other end of the spectrum. Uh, they support with management issues, financial issues, gender equality, distribution channels, poverty focus, all kinds of support because the support varies quite a lot during the life cycle if you stay with the same company for many years. And uh, as you see on the slide, there are many active companies um, under active management. So there's a lot of learning from these companies. Um, so ACF also facilitates learning between companies, but also between countries. And out of this learning, they also try to pick up what can be used for advocacy purpose. So they, they synthesize the experiences gained and they pack it uh, to use for influencing regulations, for example, in regional trade or national regulations and so on. So uh, it's a very comprehensive fund. And they also connect successful companies to scale up capital. Um, and I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we have learned that if a challenge fund is only focusing on the competition stage, it's likely to fail. You need a much more holistic approach, both when you're supporting companies uh, as well as supporting the enabling environment around. Uh, uh, and ACF, they have uh, this slogan that you see on the pictures, we don't pick winners, we start races. And that has been um, a very successful approach, I, I think we can say. And see that today we have a, a number of agreements with ACF and the biggest one is on renewable energy where, we, where it's covering 10, 10 countries. And the one hope with working with so many countries in the challenge funds is that the innovations developed in East Africa will leapfrog over to West Africa and Southern Africa. Um, since East Africa has been quite ahead in this aspect. Uh, Melina, you also wanted us to mention a bit uh, about our experience from the garment sector and what we've done in Cambodia together with many actors and also how it's being uh, replicated to other countries in, in Asia and elsewhere. Uh, so recognizing that the garment sector is, is a very important sector in, in Cambodia, starting with that experience. Uh, so it's one of the largest manufacturing industry in that country and one of the biggest employers. It accounts for uh, a lot of of their experts, exports, so notably 80% approximately, and it deploys around 700,000 people uh, in the country with a population of 16 million. Uh, the industry is female dominated and it provides an important source of income for women and their families, and it has been an incubator for the development of the country's trade unions. 
But of course, there is a problem. Uh, the manufacturing industries in Cambodia, they're characterized by unfair labor practices and they face many challenges concerning labor rights and decent working conditions. There are insufficient mechanisms for peaceful labor market dispute resolutions, and it has led to violent conflict, conflicts between workers and employers. So seeing this problem uh, in 2014, a new partnership to promote sound industry relations and decent work in the garment sector was launched by the, the Embassy of Sweden together with the International Labor Organization, uh, ILO, the Swedish Labor Union, IF Metall, and the Swedish fashion chain, H&M Group. The project aimed at promoting sound industrial relations through collective bargaining on various levels and also to strengthen the regulatory and policy framework governing industrial relations. So in a sense, policy was combined with capacity building. Uh, so whereas the project illustrates how the industry is engaging for collective bargaining at the industry level, there are, of course, important and even aggravating challenges. Uh, seeing that the trade union laws uh, nowadays rather prevents the establishment of trade unions than supports it. So moving on to the experiences at the regional level. Uh, so building on these experiences we have, not only from Cambodia, but also from public-private development partnerships in Myanmar and Ethiopia, also around the same issues, how to strengthen the social dialogue and the industrial relations and to enhance the labor rights, like the right to organize and to collective bargaining. Uh, so seeing that there were good experiences from the various countries at the bilateral level, uh, a dialogue between H&M, CEDA and ILO on how to make use of the experiences and lessons learned and scale up led to the launch of a regional program in 2019, and it, co it covers 10 countries in Asia. And the program again seeks to find solutions to decent work, environmental challenges, gender equality and productivity in global government uh, value chains. And you see that on the picture. And that's it for the examples. Thank you, Maria and Zolo. Um, you already touched on some very interesting insights there. And I was wondering actually, we read a lot about perhaps the more generic uh, success factors in partnerships. But what were to you really some of the most surprising um, factors that facilitated um, PSE across these programs and that have also yeah, really fundamental implications really for the way CEDA works? Um, yes, I, I think there were quite a number of uh, insights gained through the review. Some of them were known to us, but some were quite surprising. And uh, if I focus on the, the main ones, I mean, we have a lot of steering documents within CEDA and the uh, signals from the top management that states that we should take bigger risks. Uh, but the assessment of individual projects is almost opposite. It's focusing on risk minimizing. So the signals from top management is, is watered down along the way and mixed together with a number of other signals on what to, to give priority to. So when it reaches the individual program officer out in a particular country, the signal is about taking risk is, is not that clear anymore. Um, and another aspect that came through was the, the importance of having a, a cluster of staff with a, with a really experimental mindset, supporting each other, pushing, seeing problems, but choosing to focus on opportunities. And when you have this kind of team, yeah, then great, great things can happen. And our office in Kenya is one such example where they have um, a very interesting portfolio with a number of instruments, guarantees, PPDPs, challenge funds, but they're not focusing on the uh, on the instruments. They're focusing, of course, on the results. Uh, and these instruments are mixed up with other more traditional forms and reinforcing each other. And um, a, a third one is maybe the positive force of co-creation. It's, it's a lot of work bringing a number of new actors to work together, 
But when you do that, and when you do bring together actors that haven't met before, they do see things that wasn't there before. Things that, that none of them could see or think be on their own. They, they can create something new. It's very, it's very inspiring to see when it happens. And, and when you reach this stage, which is not easy, you have really a strong partnership where actors hold each other accountable. It's quite far from the traditional way where donors hold projects accountable when you have a project where all the actors hold each other accountable. Interesting, Maria. It looks like you already touched on the issue that risk taking is perhaps not really in the DNA of CEDA as an institution yet. And also the review highlights that um, PSE is not necessarily considered in a systematic way in the country strategy. So I was wondering, Lolo, could you elaborate in a bit more detail what um, main obstacles are still to engaging the private sector in practice and what options CEDA sees to, to address these? Yes, thanks, Melina. So the obstacles are basically the usual ones. There are no big surprises there. Um, I think Maria touched upon it uh, before that support and steering is uh, is crucial. That uh, can be done in various ways, of course, but the support from the closest manager is essential. But also through more formal processes, such as the strategy, strategies, which in our case uh, are decided by our government. So an important factor that we have discussed quite a lot lately is the incentive structure. So today there are strong incentives to disperse money to use the allocation that you've been allocated, so to speak. And of course, co-creating and finding partnerships and the right partners take a lot of time and administrative resources. So we need to kind of invest also uh, time-wise into these partnerships. And that goes a little bit against uh, the maximum use of our allocation, which is sometimes a bit problematic. Because basically, when we do private sector engagement in various forms, um, sometimes it doesn't even lead to a disbursement when we use a guarantee. And sometimes it leads to small disbursements or relatively small disbursements uh, when we engage in public-private development partnerships, for example. And uh, that, of course, does not affect our allocation that much. So we're working on it and we're discussing it a lot internally. How can we create different incentives for people to, to take on the challenges and trying to engage more strongly with the private sector? Because we see them, of course, as an important actor. Um, so we're also trying to identify and, and find not only quantitative targets to see how much resources you can mobilize, but also the qualitative ones. Uh, another challenge, of course, is that we're used to having uh, civil society actors and uh, and bigger multilateral actors as partners, but we're not as used as to have the private sector as partner. So our tools and rules and regulations sometimes are not um, does not make it that easy for us to to engage with the private sector. So we have to work very closely together with, uh, well, across uh, a team with, with many different competences, such as lawyers and controllers, et cetera, to, to try to navigate and use our tools that we have. And sometimes we need to propose changes to our rules and regulations. Uh, and that is something that we're constantly working on. Uh, and of course, something that is quite obvious is that we come with different expectations and cultures, the private sector and development partners, it's, we, we don't always understand each other's, um, well, the rationale of doing things. So we need to engage and work and, and try to kind of, uh, well, find common grounds and work on that basis. And then we can establish good partnerships. And finally, the competence, uh, Maria said that we've been working with private sector engagement for quite some time, but still the competence is a bit, um, well, isolated. And in sometimes we need to, to kind of boost uh, the competence and, and also kind of um, alert people that you need to, to look at all kinds of actors available to solve a, a development challenge. And that is something we also need to, to work on and which was identified in the study as a, as a challenge. 
Thank you, Lolo. Um, on the issue of staff competence, actually, for private sector engagement, can you tell us a bit more on yeah, the particular training needs that you still see in CEDA and how you think you may address them in the future? Yes, just uh, briefly as indicated on, on the slide and as we alluded to earlier on, there is still a need for some basic competence development and also to kind of, well, try to have a discussion around why is it important to gauge with the private sector? What kind of catalytic effect can that have on our relatively small ODA that we can bring to the table? Uh, so we see that as one of the biggest kind of, well, challenges and also the, the, the success factor if we are to achieve the SDGs. Uh, so secondly, we also need to have more exchanges, uh, something that we try to, to do also through the study to, to actually share experiences with each other. Whether if you're working in Kenya or in Albania, you can have uh, interesting exchanges and you can learn from each other so we don't have to do the same mistakes, uh, each and every one of us. Uh, thirdly, and finally, uh, we have to look at, at the whole and do a proper analysis at the beginning, but also throughout uh, a project and a partnership. We have to look at what are the main constraints or market uh, failures in this case and make a, an analysis that includes all the actors and all the interests that are involved and try to see how we can we can solve that or at least what is our role and what are the other actors' role. And how we do that is also to see, can we use on-the-job training, which is sometimes more efficient than other kind of uh, uh, online trainings or, or others? And also, how can we actually kind of cluster ourselves around different challenges and work, work in teams? And that, in addition to provide competence development together with our uh, department working on that at CEDA, which we're currently discussing how to best go about that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Lolo and Maria. I'm sure we will get back to you um, in the Q&A. But um, what you generally just mentioned, I think, will also resonate quite a bit with USAID. Um, but before we touch more on, uh, on their experiences in building staff capacity in the field, I wanted to mention that USAID actually is one of the first donor agencies globally that has published a quite comprehensive PSE policy. And to start with, I wanted to ask Amy, um, what is the key change actually that USAID seeks to achieve with this policy? And why is this also seen as a major shift for the organization as the policy says itself? I think, yeah, Amy, are you there? Can you unmute your microphone? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. We hear you now. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for the invitation. Would you like me? Um, I think I, I just lost your uh, audio for a second. Should I jump right into answering the first question? Please. Yes, that would be great. Okay. Uh, thank you so much to my colleagues from CETA. It it was really interesting to hear about um, particularly the risk averse culture, the ways in which you're trying to overcome that. And I think the example I'm going to tell from USAID is one small pilot attempting to really change the way staff behave and work and um, relate to the private sector to achieve uh, our development outcomes with the private sector. So. We um, have a new policy and the policy seeks to achieve, um, it has the right goal and the goal is a wholesale operational and cultural shift that would um, transform USAID staff from seeing themselves as resource managers to resource mobilizers. And I think that's a very different job. It's not necessarily what we were hired for, but it's what the call to action asks of us. So the, sh the shift is driven by our policy. Our policy talks about really um, zoning in on each country's individual journey to self-reliance when they no longer have a need for foreign assistance and um, invites us to partner much more strongly at every um, point of our program cycle with the private sector to achieve that goal. And I really like these five questions that USAID has in its policy. And they're untraditional questions for a lot of uh, 
staff who don't always work in, say, the agriculture or the economic growth sector. So particularly staff in education and health and contracts and finance, um, looking at can the private sector solve this problem by itself? Could there be a market-based approach to addressing the challenge and really defining what are the existing roles and interests of the private sector in addressing the challenge, looking at, well, what are the constraints that they face, seeing our role as removing their constraints um, or alleviating those strengths? So uh, moving on to the next slide, you know, what does the PSC policy say about making the shift? Um, this first principle of engage early and often is critical. It, it doesn't mean we only talk to the private sector when we're, we have resources set aside and we know we're doing a challenge or trying to find the right partner for a guarantee. Um, but just even in defining the problem, in co-creating the solutions, in co-financing um, the interventions, the invitation and the policy is to make a major part of your daily work engaging early and often. And as we all know, in order to do this, uh, staff need incentives and they themselves need to see the value of engaging the private sector for achieving the development outcomes that they're so committed to. I, I imagine CETA is similar, but at USAID, um, when we do our federal employee viewpoint survey across the entire US government, the area one of the areas where USAID rates highest in year after year is in staff commitment to mission. And so individuals who work in um, the development space care deeply and are passionate about the development outcomes. And so to the extent that they see and understand the value that the private sector can bring to achieving those, which is not necessarily a given, um, that helps uh, us achieve principle two. So principle three, we talk about expanding the approaches and tools that unlock the potential of the private sector. And I think the pivot program, which I'm about to tell you more about, you can think of as a tool uh, for staff. And we're very committed to building on and acting on evidence of what we know works um, and being really transparent about what doesn't work in our attempt to achieve these uh, policy shifts. And um, in should I just continue? Sorry. Did you, did you still have anything to add on the principles? Yeah, I'll, I'll just go ahead and go on. So in terms of this next slide that we're looking at, the policy um, announces several steps that I just mentioned. Um, and so the way it works on a day-to-day -day level for staff, like how do you actually become a resource mobilizer? Uh, and that this would apply to everyone. And you know, it's critical, particularly the contract staff, the program staff that aren't always engaging with the field, no matter where you sit, um, to move towards an outward orientation. And uh, to every operating unit in the agency now has, as, as of December 31st, a private sector engagement plan so what we saw is that there is a need for a change management and adaptive uh, leadership skill set. And so we changed our approach in this pilot, going to the next slide, to staff capacity strengthening. And um, it's what someone mentioned a moment ago, uh, what the literature shows us. We know that on-the-job training is more effective than classroom training. And that peer-to-peer -peer learning is more effective than expert-led learning. And that if we think that behavior is going to change by simply sending someone to a classroom training without follow-up, without meaningful engagement from their first-line supervisor and the peers that they're excited to be working on a, a project with, we won't see the outcomes we, we want. So we built this program around these principles. And if so, if we go to the the next slide um, and look at the key elements of this pr it, pivot stands for practical innovative on the job training and what makes it different from um, many development organizations typical approach to training and capacity building which is more classroom based um, this next slide i really like and some people when i share this presentation they sort of think this is the main slide they remember pictures tell a thousand words and so this 
program, we, we reached out to missions in Africa. We had the head of our bureau ask the mission directors, uh, really building on that key point we heard earlier that leadership is everything. And we asked missions to apply to be a part of a cohort, a small community-based fun learning environment where they selected their strongest staff across a range of sectors and functions to define their mission's key challenge in realizing this vision of wholesale operational and cultural transformation. And we brought them together in a year long on the job training cohort in which they come together four times a year in person to um, talk about what they're learning and to practice new skills. And uh, we have bi-monthly calls and then we send teams out to these missions. Um, but what this slide shows is that we've created a community that's a lot of fun where people trust one another and they have the freedom to do what my colleagues at CETA talked about earlier, take risks, fail or succeed, learn from those and keep trying again to build these new muscles and new skills and new behaviors that are needed to achieve this cultural and operational transformation. So um, if we go to the next slide, you'll see the six missions that we selected to participate in the cohort um, from all across the continent, Ghana, Kenya, Madagascar, Southern Africa, Rwanda, and Uganda. And uh, if we go to the next slide, this is sort of a little bit more about the model. So in that upper left-hand circle, it's a field-based cohort. Each mission team has five or six people, again, that leadership selected, that leadership said, you have a year to work on this. You have 20 to 25% of your time to work on this. We are, as a team, and that's a critical factor, it's not an individual's role, it's a team role, we're gonna work, we're gonna define internally what it would mean for this particular mission to realize this transformation, and we're gonna create a culture and a community that allows a non-stop a non feedback loop between all the support that exists in Washington um, and these change teams in the field, but very importantly, also amongst and between the change teams themselves. Um, so the, the, the pilot was organized both around these change teams and missions. And what we've found, you know, one of the, the best uh, outcomes is that these change teams are all saying that this is one of the most effective and first times in which they have been able to work across sectors and functions in an office with enthusiasm and effort and support for a sustained period of time to achieve their common goal, which they defined in terms of private sector engagement. We also break the groups out. You'll see on the right there, it talks about technical affinity groups. We break them out and across the missions, we get all the ag folks together, all the program folks together, all the health folks together. OAA is our contracting. We get them together so that there's more focused cross mission learning. If we go to the next slide and if I take my time and slow down a little bit here. Um, these, the key principles of seeing behavior change, which leads to increased risk taking and uh, different relationships to the private sector that results in better development outcomes and achieve our ultimate goal of ending the need for foreign assistance, the learning must be based on relationships. It's not our experience is that online learning is um, dramatically less efficient, that uh, if you look at that second bullet there, uh, learning by doing is where 70% of one's learning takes place. It's not in a classroom. It's not on an online training. It's not even reading a book. It's, you know, if you think about the last thing you really learned, you learned by doing it. And um, I, I usually tell this really simple anecdote. You know, if you wanted to learn how to play tennis, you wouldn't go to a hotel and watch like a week long um, video series of Wimbledon's and Serena talking about playing tennis, you must pick up the racket and play. And it's great to have a coach and you, you know, even playing without a coach is great, but you have to play. So the focus is strongly on learning by doing. Sure, 20% in this model is social learning, learning with coaches and mentors and 10%, 10% is where we think um, the balance should be in terms of typical content transfer. But having a safe community of deep relationships that 
continue for time, over time, and in a group that isn't too big, uh, really we've seen creates the right ecosystem to get staff to build the competencies that we're looking for um, and you know to achieve these different outcomes. Uh, under the resources second block there, um, I often say if leadership doesn't support this kind of on-the-job model or any model, I mean, then there's no way it's going to succeed. You must have leadership buy-in, strong. And something my CETA colleagues referred to earlier, um, it's not enough to have it at the beginning. You have to have it repeated, 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 that not only does leadership, and leadership at multiple levels, not just the, so, you know, the head, the CEO of your unit, but also the full chain, if they start to say, oh, I really don't want you to participate in this next webinar with your you know, community of practice uh, or go to the next in-person meeting where you're going to be practicing playing tennis, practicing new skills, I really need you to stay back and write this, then we won't see the change take place. So it's, it's not one-off leadership buy-in, it's continued commitment and support for this on-the-job learning. We do have coaches and mentors. Um, this, another key aspect uh, of the Pivot program, um, which I'm surprised I haven't mentioned until right now, is we don't think that in order to achieve the goals of engaging the private sector um, systemically and intentionally in a resourced way across the whole program cycle is simply a technical challenge. We, we also are very aware that staff need competencies in two complementary supportive skill sets, which are collaboration, learning, and adapting as one, and the third is in leadership. And so the program we've built incorporates competencies and skill sets and behaviors in all three lanes, not just private sector engagement, to see the change. So on leadership skills, um, we talk about active listening, we talk about self-awareness, um, we talk about giving and receiving effective feedback. We have a new leadership philosophy at USAID that calls out the fact that leaders are mindful and um, really bringing what the world is learning in terms of staff resilience and mindfulness into the agency to promote, to promote effective change management. And like I said, staff are always interested and always hungry to hear from one another much more than they're interested in hearing from the quote unquote so-called expert. Um, occasionally they want to hear from the expert, but they, they, want to, they want to know how people just like them have done it or haven't done it. And, uh, you know, in a conversation and in a relationship that is recurring and can deepen over time. So um, the last green box there, adapting, I would say in, you know, my 20 plus career in the year long career in the agency, it hasn't been until this program that I've had an experience of practicing adaptive development programming. And we, um, we have some uh, resources in the pilot that are experts in adaptation, and this really comes down to every single thing we do, every webinar we do, every day we meet in person, um, every uh, TDY we send out to a mission to help the change team take these concepts and this practice to the broader mission. We constantly stop and say, what's working? What didn't work? How can it be changed? And um, we do that in a way that really allows for defenses to be low and learning to take place. And I would say just about everything we thought we were going to do, we've changed many, 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 many times over the program. And having a system and a culture uh, in place to allow for that kind of constant adaptation and regular pause and reflex has been one of the successes of the program. Um, moving on to the next slide, I mentioned that this is a competency-based model and we have a really robust uh, set of competencies and practices and behaviors for um, the five key uh, skills that we think are necessary. Um, and just to, to name them, uh, they're not on this slide, but the top one uh, is individual and team readiness to engage in a change management process for private sector engagement. And many of my colleagues think that might, might be the most unusual aspect of the program. Uh, one of my colleagues in the cohort said, you know, Amy, I've been at USAID for the, you know, 10 years. I've seen 25 new initiatives come out, of which PSE is one. 
this is the first one where we've had sustained support for staff to make the change. And so this idea that it, you know, the agency, yes, it put out a policy and it said, send us your plan by December 31st. But we have evidence for the difference in terms of what that policy and what that request for a plan and a point of contact in a working group achieves with and without this wraparound support. The second competency um, that all three of these red circles contribute to is building staff's capacity to articulate, align, and um, understand the intersection between USAID's development goals and the private sector's um, goals. You know, the, where's the win-win? Uh, and the third has to do with mastering the action planning process around your program cycle document documents to finalize things and get approval. The fourth uh, is turning ideas into strategic approaches, you know, really turning them into deals or challenges or transactions or MOUs. Um, and you really have to be a master of your organization's contracts and cooperative agreements and grants to be able to do that. And the, the last competency is relationship management with the private sector. It goes back to something I said earlier. It's not enough to simply um, knock on the private sector's door or anyone's door for that matter when you want something from them. It requires, just like this program does, longer term relationship management and relationship building. So in terms of the key lessons so far, moving on to the next, um, moving to the next two slides, we did, a, we've done, you know, we, we have an embedded learning advisor who has done ongoing surveys of the cohort participants, the Washington staff who lead the sector groups, the our implementing partners who serve as coaches and technical experts that go to the field, the mission directors, um, we as a control group, if you will, of private sector engagement points of contacts and missions in Africa and across the world that weren't a part of the program. And when we, but it, we had this, opportunity this year because everybody got the new policy that came more or less at the beginning of 2019 and everyone, every oper operating unit across the, the globe had to turn in a plan by December 31st, but only six missions had this intensive pivot um, learning by doing uh, community building approach. And what we saw is that those in the pivot cohort mem uh, group, six missions, 36 staff, when you ask those staff how they rate Washington field support, they see it as a significant value add. This comes in stark comparison to how our colleagues outside of the program don't. And I think this has to do with a complex transition that our agency is, is going through. Um, but it really matters that it, there's ongoing regular contact with the same people inside of a small group that's left that, group, that cohort, those six missions, really feeling like they know exactly who to talk to and about what, and they get to listen to the conversations that other missions are having in other sectors with Washington in a succinct, efficient way twice a month that has yielded this result. The second result is that those in this pivot cohort members um, they talk about how not a success is that they have strong working groups. This point I made earlier, it's not about an individual, it's about a group and that those groups have high trust, high communication, high results orientation. Um, and that outpaces what we see in missions that while the policy is called for a working group, the working groups um, have struggled to be stood up in a way that leaves those individuals measuring their own effectiveness in very high terms in terms of trust and effectiveness and result orientation. And I think uh, one of the reasons is there's such a constraint on time and everyone uh, across the agency is constantly stretched for time and being in a program where your leadership and your supervisor set ahead of time, you're allowed to work on this in a team. And of course those teams had to deliver results that a, you know, convince their leadership to keep allowing them to make that investment over the year, uh, despite the high level policy, um, what we've got at the end of the year is, you know, very strong working groups that are high trust and committed to, to moving forward. The third, and this is not a surprise considering that we have put a strong emphasis on collaboration learning and adapting that CLA and leadership skills, the pivot cohort members um, 
rank themselves as really appreciating and understanding and applying those aspects of their work as well. And this last bullet is interesting. So across the agency, every operating unit had to pick one private sector engagement point of contact. And everybody picked someone who had a lot of strength in that area. So, but if you had to pick six people from your mission, you quickly run out of folks who have a lot of skills in that area. You get your one, maybe you have two, it's hard to come up with six. So one of our most interesting findings is when individuals that are the PSC POCs across the globe ranked their skill set at the beginning of the year, um, you know, the PSC POCs are high, but the pivot cohort members were comparatively low. But after a year, that pivot cohort group sees itself um, and it has the commitment and the capacity and the enthusiasm uh, at the same levels we see of those who at the beginning of the year started with that skill set, um, who brought that skill set actually in from former work and education. So that's a pretty um, exciting outcome. If we move to the next slide, the critical enablers of success, uh, you must have technical expertise in the community, but not at the expense of the collaboration learning and, and adapting and leadership support. Uh, you must connect the team's work to program cycle re requirements because you know that's where they ha that's work they have to get done. The agency initiatives, the political priorities are where their leadership is going to be directing them. So connecting uh, the work that the team is doing to the things they have to do anyway has been a critical enabler of success. Primary barriers, um, limited staff time and bandwidth due to competing priorities. I bet everybody nods their head when they hear that. Inflexible funding, some rigid organizational structures, maybe not exactly clear PSC objectives in terms of how we're going to measure success. And there is a, uh, a, it's a challenge for staff and leadership to appreciate how much time this takes to achieve the goal of total operational and cultural transformation so that working closely with the private sector would just be our, all of our bread and butter. Um, in terms of the next slide, how are we going to take this pilot program forward? The pilot comes to an end in March. Uh, we do plan to continue this on-the-job, learning by doing, private sector engagement plus CLA and leadership approach um, to our own bureau here in Washington. We plan to invite a uh, selection process for a second year. We're asking the current cohort um, how they would like to continue into the future. Um, we're considering having the private sector itself be a part of the cohort going forward. And um, and so maybe I'll, I'll leave it there uh, and turn it back to you, Melina, for, for any questions for CETA or USAID. Great. Thanks so much, Amy, for these, uh, well, very open and thought-provoking insights into how um, skills development can be done differently. Um, and also for going through the slides so efficiently, um, it's great. So we have an, uh, around 15 minutes, 20 minutes now for the Q&A. Uh, and we have received quite a few questions in advance and also already a couple here in the chat box. Please type your questions now as we start answering uh, a few that have already come in. Um, so Mike Klassen actually asked a question to Sida, but I think it might apply to USAID as well. He says the point about mixed signals and incentives for risk taking is fascinating. Uh, to what extent are individuals like local program officers aware of their potential risk aversion? Um, also their managers, are they aware of their risk aversion? And what strategies uh, for organizational change is CEDA considering? And perhaps we can also ask Amy about USAID afterwards. We have, as I said, quite clear signals from the top on taking more risks, but uh, this has not yet sort of filtered through all the systems. So if the, the sort of IT support I that we have... I think the question goes to CEDA, correct, Melina? Uh, it goes to CEDA, yes, and, and I think Maria is just uh, answering, um, but it probably applies to USAID, so maybe as well, maybe I'll, I'll get back to you after that. Yeah, so the, the systems that we have to, to support ourselves when we work on individual projects is sort of having a, a different look at risks. So the, the questions in our sort of IT systems when you're assessing a project is 
is sort of bringing you to a um, risk minimization, minimizing risks. So I guess there is some work we have to do still internally to get the whole structure to, to enable us to take risk. And also, of course, we have to differentiate between different types of risk. One risk is uh, related to internal control and steering. And another risk is working with companies that um, will not bring the intended result in spite of having good internal controls and so on. So, um, um, and usually also it takes a while before instructions from Stockholm is sort of filtered down to the embassies and to all the staff that works in an embassy. So um, I think it's a process that has to go on and maybe we have to increase the pressure on these kind of uh, topics. Thank you, Maria. Um, I think pivot on USAID sites is a critical part of promoting organizational change around risk taking. Um, Amy, do you have any further reflections on that? Yeah, I, yeah, I would say um, part of how I understand the understood the original question is like to what extent do staff understand their and their supervisors their own risk appetite? Are they aware? And then what incentives are there for behaving differently? And I would say incentives and, and the, the, um, we start off in a negative context for both. I think most staff at every level are unaware of their risk appetite um, and, and many other aspects of how they work and their effectiveness, self-awareness is a core element of our foreign service evaluation and promotion system and yet the, you know if we just say self-awareness um that's a, that's there's such a, a large distance between understanding the concept and actually being self-aware and being self-aware in your work so self-awareness is critical uh in the pivot program we do a lot of measurement and reflection and um on all three aspects of so private sector engagement, collaboration, learning, adapting, and leadership. And, I, and you, could, you could assess if you think risk belongs in all three of those. And what our colleagues told us is, you know, they all assess, they, they assess themselves much higher on things like collaborating, learning, and adapting, and leadership than they would at the end of the program, because they know a lot more about what those things are. Um, and then in terms of a plot, say you knew you were somewhat risk averse. Uh, what we've done in the pivot program, and I think is essential for any organization that wants to see behavior change is we've created multiple practice opportunities to try a different risk profile on. And we've really focused on the conversations, the relationship building with the private sector as a key area of risk, if you will, to, to overcome, you know, with officers who don't usually do this, health, education, democracy, and governance. And what we saw is it quickly changes their, their interest in trying again and their ability to share um, what they've learned with colleagues who are also risk averse almost magically changes with one practice round. And uh, so um, I, would, I would say both folks don't know how risk averse they really are and you can measure that, but until you get them practicing, uh, whatever that profile was doesn't change. Thank you, Amy. Um, Thank you, Amy. Um, sorry, there's some echo. But, sorry, um, there's some echo. But uh, we'll just pick up we'll on another. Just pick up on another question. Um, um, staff capacity building staff side. Capacity building side. Switch off your microphone. Sorry. Switch off your microphone. Sorry. Um, and the question comes from Maya, who uh, says that, uh, thank you, um, no, I don't have the echo anymore. So Maya asks, um, PSE does not automatically lead to systemic change. Uh, also, it is necessary to engage competing private sector players as well as governments to reach systemic change. So how um, do you see that have you said we encourage and guide staff and practice to design programs that take such a systemic change? Anyone who would like to answer that question? Repeat the question. We had some problems hearing it. Okay. Uh, well, it's also written here in the chat box. So um, the question was around um, 
I guess you also said earlier in your presentation that you take a more systemic lens now in private sector engagement, which often involves engaging competing private sector players as well as governments. And, and how in practice do you encourage and guide staff to, to design PSD programs with such a systemic view? Mm. Yeah, well, we have, um, let's say you, you have um, an objective in your strategy to, um, to work on employment, for example, or youth employment. Well, well, then we try together to analyze uh, the actors that are involved in in this in this field. Who are the actors you need to work with to to reach youth employment? Well, you have to work with uh, ministries, maybe Ministry of Labor, maybe Ministry of Education. You have to work with related authorities. You have to work with maybe primary education, vocational training, civil society, and obviously. You also have to work with the private sector, who is the main sort of interpreter of um, what are the employment skills that you need to to access an employment. Mm -hmm. So, um, by by sort of trying to analyze which are the actors um, sort of working in this space, you sort of you get a map, and then you start sort of looking into so where are the sort of key key areas where you can increase, sort of get good leverage, um, sort of trying to move away from single projects, but to trying to look at a more holistic pictures. I don't know, would you like to add something? Yeah, what we've been doing, we've been doing a, a market system uh, development evaluation uh, just last year. And one of the key things from that one is that we we're trying to institutionalize the market systems development approach and also working adaptively, uh, which is is kind of part of, of that. And so what we're doing now is is firstly to develop a toolbox, which is already done, and then now trying to kind of build capacity around that so that when you look at a context, as Maria said, then you look at it holistically and trying to identify what are the main constraints, who are the actors involved, etc. So what we're doing right now is actually trying to institutionalize, uh, well, the market systems development approach and working together with people out uh, at our embassies and those with a lot of experience in, in this uh, area and trying to kind of boost the general knowledge uh, in within CEDA of being able to use this approach more, well, um, more often. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I, I take a question for USAID next. Um, Cecilia Brady asks, how aware of Pivot are private sector partners and have you seen them respond differently to Pivot team outreach? And I'll combine that with a question we've received in advance from Technoserve who also asks, um, what can actually be done to bring company owners on board to meetings and discussions? Um, perhaps this also implies a different type of, of engaging them and reaching out to them um, that perhaps the Pivot team is, is more capable of doing. Um, but uh, Amy, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, the first thing I would say is that outside of the walls of USA, the private sector would, would never hear the word Pivot. Uh, or a pivot team. So what they what they're seeing all over the globe, whether our staff is in the pivot cohort or not, is USAID is making a very deliberate, resourced, intentional push to engage the private sector um, in every part of the program cycle and to deepen our relationships in every direction. So what does that mean? It means it. I would hope, and I hope we're measuring this, that in the countries we work in, we are having the private sector help us define the problem, co-design the solution, co-finance the solution, and co-implement the solution. So I think you already are seeing that. Now, our, our pivot countries, yeah, they're doing this, they're doing this, they should be doing it a little further, a little harder, and a little broader than our missions that don't have the support. So I think what you really get in a pivot mission is what I just described, co-identifying the problem, co-designing this and co-financing the solution. You're, you're, it's highly probable you're going to get that 
strategic markets based approach with your agriculture and economic growth staff. It's much less likely that it's going to happen in environment, health, education, democracy, and governance. Inside of the missions where this cultural change is really taking root, you're going to see those atypical officers recalculating where they bring the private, where they partner with the private sector to define and design solutions and implement them and learn from them and finance them. So um, it's definitely happening uh, and it's happening a lot. And, and I think the pivot program is an accelerator for missions that are really ready to take on this high touch immersive experience that leads to a whole of mission um, culture change. Thank you, Amy. Um, I take another question from the one submitted in advance. Um, and this one uh, comes also from a USAID colleague who asks, in a nascent or fragile market, perhaps, what are opportunities actually for engaging the private sector? Do you see any differences in how private sector engagement can successfully work in these environments? Perhaps the CEDA have any thoughts on that? Yeah, or nascent emerging economies that um, are still, well, maybe have very thin markets um, yeah. and not really showing signs of strong growth. Yeah, uh, we have, um, when it comes to sort of post-conflict and fragile markets, we have, um, we, we do use similar instruments, for example, challenge funds, but we can have a different ratio to to reduce the risk even further for companies who wants to move into such markets. So in a normal context, we would uh, share maybe 50% that the company brings 50% of the funding and uh, the donor pays 50%. But in fragile markets, uh, we can take 70%. Um, we can also, we have also programs where we have uh, worked uh, a lot building on uh, diaspora to sort of uh, to to sort of harvest their knowledge and their often higher risk appetite to invest in these contexts. So you can I think you can use the same instruments but tweak them a bit more to reduce the risk and thereby encourage the private sector to move in. Okay, interesting. Thanks. Um, we also had another question more on, on the how to actually of, of private sector engagement. And I, I think it's probably fair to say that typically now there is an ambition to engage the private sector over longer periods of time uh, in a more strategic manner. But we also have one question actually that, that asked the opposite. How could we engage the private sector in, in very short term, two years or less type of projects? Um, are there any quick wins? Are there any any solutions to, to doing that in a in a short-term project. Do you have any thoughts on that? Also, Amy um, or Ololo, Maria, whoever would like to, to respond to this one. Yeah, I can say, I think there is a bit of a contradiction in the question because normally when we work with the private sector, our, our engagement is meant to be catalytic and then the donor is meant to move away, but we do hope that the private sector is there for the long term. So um, I, I fail to see a bit wh why would we um, like to just have short, uh, short relationship. I mean, the private sector is there for the long term. Mm -hmm. So indeed, you confirm that actually there is an ambition to, to form a longer term relationship and catalyze um, private sector investment in the long run. Yes, definitely. <laughs> OK, great. We had another follow-up question by Cecilia here to, to USAID and CEDA, actually both of them. Any new learnings about engaging with local companies versus multinationals? Are there any difference perhaps in the way you engage these different types of companies? Yeah, I want to, this is Amy from USAID. I want to say something both about the last question and then I'll leave this question to CEDA. But in terms of quick wins with the private sector, when you take a change management approach, which is essential if you want to see this cultural change, uh, we've talked about how first the staff has to hear and a sense of urgency that this change is continually reported as something that is going to make a difference in development outcomes now. You need a team working on it. You need a vision. And then it's essential to have quick wins. 
and um, to identify what are the constraints to those quick wins, remove those constraints, but to get those quick wins. And I think part of the place to get quick wins is I've heard staff in every sector across the globe say, we didn't realize we were already doing private sector engagement. We just didn't call it that. And so there are lots of ways within our existing suite of mechanisms and programs to strengthen um, relationships with the private sector or calculate them differently or even bring them to your own, you know, for staff to sort of mine their own portfolio to see what's actually happening with that lens. Or within what's already possible without setting up a new relationship and a new contract to say, okay, within what's going on, what could we do within six months? And uh, in aid, and I imagine it's this way in CETA too, we often have to get some quick wins to keep momentum going on any initiative. And so I think um, the, the critical factor is if you know the resources you have is just to get out there and find some creative ways to do something in the short term, six year, six months to 12 months. And as my colleague from CETA said, of course, that's not enough. You must be looking at a longer term horizon if you want to see, you know, system level change. But without quick wins, um, this momentum will deflate. So I, I just wanted to add that and turn it over to CETA for Cecilia's second question. Thanks, Amy, for adding. Thanks, Amy, for adding. Lulu and um, Maria, I would just like to respond to the question about um, lessons around engaging local versus multinational companies. And I think that's probably the last one we can take in, in the time we have. Different experiences and our experiences from engaging in private public development partnerships are normally with bigger multinationals. And whereas with challenge funds, of course, that is targeting small and medium sized or rather very small uh, enterprises. But of course, recognizing that that uh, the largest share of all the kind of employment opportunities are within the micro and small and medium sized enterprises locally based in our developing or our partner countries. Of course, it's important to bring uh, them on board, but of course, it depends also who are the beneficiaries, what is the development challenge, and who can bring up about the change. But our mission statement says that we should work to mobilize engagement and find locally owned solutions. Uh, and of course, the local kind of stakeholders, they are very important in this aspect. So what we can do is also is to bring about or to bring various stakeholders together so we can bring the expertise and perhaps the financial resources from multinationals bring that to the to the local kind of uh, context and trying to to facilitate and broker some kind of twinning relationship so that we make best use of all and different kinds of expertise knowledge and and resources but it's something that we will have to work a bit uh, harder on in, in many ways but it also is part of this systemic way of, of working. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lolo, for that reflection. And I think with that, we, we come to the end of the one hour 15 we had allocated for this. But um, thanks so much to Amy, Lolo and Maria for their input today. Uh, very useful. And thanks to all of you who have joined as participants. Um, we hope we, uh, we answered a lot of your questions, at least. And we look forward to, to engaging with you further on this topic. Thank you, everyone, and um, bye for now. Oh, because of